Welcome to this brief discussion on the importance of agreeing the regulatory framework for decarbonisation of shipping. I'm Charles Goddard, I'm Editorial Director of the Economist Group, and I'm joined by Jeremy Nixon, Chief Executive of Ocean Network Express. Welcome, Jeremy. So, Jeremy, let's begin, shall we? Um, this with the IMO, and in fact, we're going to be focusing largely on the IMO in this discussion. There has been, as you know, a great deal of criticism uh, for several years now of the uh, International Maritime Organization, the global regulatory body for uh, shipping, for the slow progress being made towards uh, the decarbonization of shipping. And inevitably, a collection of countries uh, under the United Nations umbrella, by definition, will not move quickly. But can I ask you, um, uh, as a large global shipping company with customers pressing you on the one hand uh, to decarbonize, as well as shareholders perhaps on the others and regulators elsewhere on the others. What is your sense? Are you frustrated, should I say, at the, the slow pace of move, movement in the IMO? And what do you see as the priorities for accelerating that progress? Well, thank you, Charles. And uh, I think, first of all, maybe just to kick off, uh, for those not so familiar with the IMO, the IMO is based in London. It's a UN body. It's made up of some 175 countries. It was formed in 1948, and it has really been the bedrock or the industry regulator for overseeing shipping in terms of safety and regulation and international protocols for a very long time now. And uh, I think over time in an effective way and, and created this alignment so we have truly international protocols. And we're somewhat lucky to have that. And not many industries have a global body at the UN level who provide that kind of guidelines and that, that formulation for regulatory progress. So I think, you know, it, it, it's very positive we have the IMO. I think secondly, as you rightfully say, there has been some criticism of the IMO that, uh, you know, on the environmental agenda, which has really been a very large part of its workload over the last three, four years, that we aren't seeing more concrete action. We aren't seeing a faster pace in terms of setting higher aspirations to decarbonize and putting in place the building blocks to allow companies and fuel energy companies to, to move forward more quickly with the investment. And I, I think we have to be realistic here. As, as we know, uh, the I, IMO is, uh, or any UN body is only as good as its governments and the consensus seeking across those governments. And unfortunately, as we're only too well aware, governments don't always see eye to eye. Different countries are at different levels in their economic development. Certain countries have technical advantages in certain types of industry and others and others. So there's always going to be some, some mix. And what is the most important thing is for shipping, because we are a global industry, because we are the, the, effectively the servants of global trade, we need to have one set of uniform rules and regulations because our ships go everywhere around the world and our customers are trading everywhere around the world. And we can't have lots of different bilateral type arrangements. We need to have one multilateral framework. So to, to be fair to the IMO, they have initially set uh, so, so some guidelines in and around the targets uh, to, to get to 2050 to halve the amount of our carbon footprint. And they have put in place some specific uh, measures in and around the carbon intensity of the existing ships that are on the water. Uh, but there's a bit more detail to be done on that. Maybe we'll, we'll go into that in a moment. But in summary, I think we have to be realistic. In summary, I think we have to work with the IMO. We have to work with the governments that make up the IMO and work forward in lockstep to achieve this significant environmental milestone in our industry. So you mentioned uh, the diversity of the players in the IMO and uh, of the countries, clearly some well wealthier, some poorer, uh, a, a complex and fragmented industry that's there as well. Um, and I just wondered, this question that you implied uh, sort of was in there on, around the level playing field, as a, as a first world shipping uh, company in a sector, I think, dominated only by uh, an, a smaller number of players, what, you know, most of whom I think are, are committed at this point to decarbonization and are, are finding ways forward to try and do that. What, what are your concerns exactly about the level playing field? I can sense why there are concerns in, you know, in countries in Africa and uh, elsewhere in Asia around this, but what are your concerns about the level playing field? Yeah, I think, you know, at the end of the day, uh, the container shipping sector is one sector of, of, of overall shipping. So shipping overall is probably about 60,000 vessels 
Container shipping is about 8,000 vessels, but container shipping is quite a significant part of that GDP and trading activity because it's a liner service. So we're, a, we're an owner of ships, we're the operator of the ships, but we're also dealing directly with the end manufacturers and the retailers and the commodity trading houses. So we have a direct interaction with those customers. And of course, they're sourcing and manufacturing in many, many different locations around the world. And they need a simplified way of being able to trade and move their products and understand what is the, the carbon footprint and the cost of doing so. And we need that to be, be universal. So, you know, container shipping by, by definition is very standardized. Uh, we move things in 20 foot containers or 40 foot containers generally. And we, you know, we have a very simplified and structurally uniform way of, of handling it operationally. And in terms of the terms of trade, uh, the, the way that we transact, the way we provide information to the various stakeholders, the way that uh, we, 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 we handle the safety issues is all done in a very standardized way. And likewise, um, to move from this carbon environment we're in today, where those 8,000 container ships are burning essentially fuel oil. Um, we have made significant progress, I have to say, over the last 15 years in terms of making that carbon efficiency better by building bigger, more modern ships with better technology. And so the actual uh, CO2 per tonne has come down a lot through that design. But we now need to move to these super fuel efficient ships, which will be using green fuels. And to do that, we need the technology to build those ships. We need the fuel to be available. And that fuel is going to be a lot more expensive. So the first mover advantage at the moment when we look at the level playing field is not level. Because whoever goes first, these ships are going to be a lot more expensive. And instead of paying maybe, for example, $600 a ton for fuel oil, you'll be paying probably around $1,600 per ton fuel oil. So you need to have some way of leveling up. Otherwise, however, you know, how much you ever involve, involve the environment, however strong your CSR, financially as a company, you cannot afford to make major investments while the rest of your competitors don't. Uh, otherwise, you would simply uh, run out of money and, and, and become bankrupt. So it needs to be um, a level playing field and we need to see common incentives right across the playing field for every country, every nationality, every port, every shipping company. Well, let's talk briefly then about one of the mechanisms that would uh, help that level playing field uh, come about, and that is the carbon price or uh, some sort of carbon levy or fuel levy indeed. I, I know you're in favor of the levy in some ways, but of course, in general, I think in favor of some sort of carbon price. I mean, they are ultimately all a price on carbon, aren't they? Um, what, first of all, do you think is the, the advantages of having a fuel or a carbon levy versus a, a cap and trade price. But secondly, importantly, what is the role of the IMO in trying to drive um, uh, the acceptance uh, across its membership of some sort of carbon price, whether it be a levy or cap and trade? Yeah. So, so Charles, the, the container shipping industry is made up of about 30, 40 companies. But as you rightfully say, probably, you know, the top 20 of those companies have quite a uh, quite a lot of market concentration. So we're probably about 75% of the total global trade in containers. And we have a trade association called the World Shipping Council. And we put together a green strategy paper on behalf of the industry, which we are now taking to the IMO for the MEPC 78 session, which is coming up very shortly. And we've outlined six key requirements. One of those requirements is that we need to have a carbon price. And that that carbon price needs to be reflected in some kind of market-based measure. And as you rightfully say, that could be a, that could be a levy on fuel in terms of a, a fuel levy, uh, or that could be some kind of cap and trade system or, or trading system. Um, we're trying to be a little bit agnostic around those different mechanisms because there's some pros and cons of different ways. But I think the first point is, and fundamentally is, is we do need to have a mechanism. So. Today, as we mentioned that example of if fuel oil is $600 a tonne, but it's going to cost $1,800 a tonne when that new fuel becomes available, which is probably going to be around about 228, 229, 230 in terms of the time timeline, um, we, we, we need something that's going to level up that playing field. Um, the, 
The level is, is of course, open to discussion, debate. There have been a number of studies done, a uh, very, very good one recently by the Getting to Zero Coalition with London University, the UMass study, and a number of other studies which probably indicate we need a carbon price of probably around about $100 a ton CO2, which would translate then to about $300 a ton in terms of fuel oil price by 2030. And then that would go up further uh, over time. Um, so, so I think it's it's important that we do agree on a, on a carbon price, and the exact mechanism. Of course, uh, I think uh, you know, for our simplicity's sake, we think that a carbon levy is is very easy and much more predictable. Uh, it's easy to explain to the customer. It's easier because we would simply be charged that by the bunker company, the fuel company, which we would then pass on to the IMO potentially, and then we would also, you know, that would all be regulated, be very clear on the invoice. And then we could show to the customers and right through the supply chain what the cost of that carbon fuel is. Trading systems, uh, a little bit more complex, a bit more difficult to understand. Uh, you get into all sorts of issues in and around, you know, what are your grandfather rights on a cap, cap system? How much uh, are you entitled to? And then you have to buy these credits. And it's, it's anything but predictable. It's anything but stable. But I, I'll, I'll keep that part out of it. I think the fundamental point is that the container shipping companies fundamentally agree around a carbon price and market-based measures. And as my company, ONE, we now do all our investment decisions now where we have an internal carbon price. So, I mean, and that, Matt, that carbon price, the fees generated by that carbon levy or by a carbon price uh, would be managed and then put back into uh, R&D and various other elements of the uh, equation that need to be in place for full decarbonization of shipping? Is that what you would see happening? I think it's, uh, again, this is something which the IMO has to work through with those constituent countries. And there, there are different views amongst the countries. Some, some countries want to take all that money straight off uh, the shipping companies and the bunker and fuel companies and pass that on to, uh, to other countries to help with their development of defense systems against climate change. Others uh, take the view that actually container shipping, you know, we have to build these ships, we've got to find these engine systems, we've got to develop these fuels. We're looking at about $1.5 trillion worth of investment over the next 30 years for the shipping industry. So so we, we, we need to find a balance. And, and uh, so we, we do need some of this money to come back in. And actually, the uh, the shipping industry, the International Chamber of Shipping, and all the various trade associations, including the World Shipping Council, are really asking for two things. One is uh, a, a immediately a an R and D levy that we would put on fuel, which uh, we would actually pay as the users, uh, the purchase of the fuel, and that would be then captured by the IMO, and that money would then be put into a fund, which would then be used for R and D projects. The, uh, the, the Ricardo Consulting Company's recently done an analysis, which is presented to the, to, to the World Shipping Council and to the uh, International Chamber of Shipping and the IMO, which identifies about 260 projects or problem uh, areas that need to get resolved in this decarbonization journey. So there's a lot to do on the R&D side, and we're going to need quite a lot of money to do that. So we, we would like to see a certain amount of money put aside for R&D. And then the second part is, yes, does all that money need to, 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 to go out of the system or can somebody be that retained? So if you take the fact that there are around 250 million tons of bunker fuel today being bunkered, and if you take a $300 per ton uh, fuel price based off $100 per ton CO2 tax, that would generate about $75 billion in, uh, in a fuel levy. Um, you know, should all that $75 billion go outside the industry or some of that should come back in to help with that very significant investment. And naturally, as you'd expect, uh, as, as, as a major shipping company and as an industry, we would argue and say, we're going to take the, co the cost of decarbonizing, but please incentivize us and please help us bring some of those funds back in to help us speed up and accelerate that, uh, that investment that we have to do. So which raises briefly uh, one of my final questions, uh, and that is around the other regulatory measures that are needed in order to be able to stimulate and accelerate uh, the decarbonization of shipping. What do you see as the priorities there in the sort of finalization of the regulatory roadmap, uh, if I can say it that way? And what role does the IMO play in that process too? 
Well, the IMO has brought in um, the efficient EEDI, which is the Efficiency Design Index for new ships. So we have a we have now a, a new index where all ships have to be when they're actually uh, built perform to a certain level. And then recently they brought in the EEXI, which is a efficiency rating for existing ships on the water. And of course, that's a very important point because we have 60,000 ships out there. Probably we're only going to build four to 5,000 ships a year. So it takes quite a long time for the existing ships using the uh, legacy type fuels and legacy designs to work themselves through the system. So if we can uh, be encouraged and incentivized to make the existing ships more efficient over time, that's a good thing. And the IMO is, is working on that uh, EEXI and that CII carbon intensity indicator, which would actually cap some of the speed uh, performances of, of existing ships. But a little bit more work is needed in that area to explain how that would work and exactly how some of those mechanisms. We've talked about the market-based measures is really the big nut. Uh, you know, what 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 uh, fuel price should we use? What mechanism? When should it come in? How much of that uh, uh, collective money should come back into the industry to support the investment? And then there's areas around, for example, uh, the design of ships and how we can further improve those. And also we have to look at how to, to train up uh, and, and, and our crew for the additional uh, technological handling of, of these different fuel types and ships. And then we also need to work with the ports industry and the fuels industry to accelerate the production of green fuels and try to minimize the number of different fuels we're going to have and the different types of bunkering systems uh, and try and narrow that down to probably two or three solutions and then over time maybe down to one or two. So there's quite a lot of work needed in that area around port standards, bunkering standards, fuel type specifications. And then maybe lastly is the carbon trading accounting. So how do you prove, how do you declare what your carbon footprint is? How can you verify that? How can the banks and the regulators verify that you're performing to those standards? And doing that in a, a common standardized way so that we all have a level playing field, a level way of auditing and, and indicating what our actual carbon footprint performance is. So quite a lot of work to be done over the next two to three years by the IMO. And we, we all need to work and support on that. So, Jeremy, a huge agenda ahead, uh, both uh, for yourselves and the IMO, and indeed both on water and on land. Um, uh, thank you very much for helping us uh, understand that. And uh, uh, thank you for joining us on this uh, brief conversation. Jeremy Nixon, thank you.